Welcome to session seven, uh, the attributes of God. Tonight we're going to be discussing the names of God. If you look at your notes, the introduction says the attributes of God reveal to us aspects of his character. We also come to understand the character of God by his names, which are given to us in scriptures. These names are not of human invention, but of divine origin. God told us his names in scriptures. The scriptures point to the significance of his name. Now you have to realize in, in the Middle Eastern cultures where Israel is and, the, and where the Bible grew out of, there was more to a name than just the way it sounded. Uh, a lot of times we pick names just because we like the way that that name sounds. Um, they didn't necessarily do that in Bible days. A name meant something. It represented something. There was heritage and lineage attached to that name. So when we look at these names of God, we're looking at it as his character. When we pray in Jesus' name, we're not just throwing his name out there like we're name dropping it. We're praying in the, the character and the will that Jesus would pray in. Psalm 8.1 says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Psalm 48.10 says, like your name, O God, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. And Proverbs 18.10 says, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. So in this session, we're going to talk about some of the revealed names of God. First one is, is God with a capital G. God with a capital G. We're not talking about a little G. We're talking about a big G. Many times in scripture where you see something capitalized in our English uh, translations of the Bible, it stands for deity. For, 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 for God. Letter A, in Christian usage, God functions as a proper noun. Now, when I say God, the majority of the time, I'm talking about God, the one and only. I'm not talking about the gods of this world, or let's say a guitar god, or, or a god as some uh, sports uh, figures have kind of elevated to that status in the minds and, and the ideas of media and, and culture. I'm talking about the one and only God. Number one, it is his personal name. It's his personal name. Now I may start out my prayer with dear God or in some other way, but when I do that, I'm using his proper name. To me, it belongs to, to one being only and draws into itself all the thoughts of the biblical names that the scriptures describe. The English word God is, trans, is a translation of the Hebrew word. The Old Testament, as we know, was written in Hebrew, and the New Testament was written primarily in Greek. So in the Old Testament, we have Hebrew translations of God. The first one is Elohim. Elohim. And it's first found, the very first verse of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The very first verse of Genesis says, In the beginning Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Now Elohim is a plural for the word El. Some people would say, why is this plural? Okay. Well, first of all, in the Hebrew language, they did not have capitalization. So, if you wanted to show intensity, you made the name plural. That's what they did. It also indicates the fullness of the word. It indicates that this ought to be in capital letters. Also, if you remember when we talked about the Trinity in that, in that very portion of scripture, it says, let us make man in our image. It's a plurality that shows. Many of you who speak a different language, let's say Spanish or French, you know that those languages are a lot more expressive 
than the English language. Let me give you a, a, a scenario or an example. The word love. Now, in Greek, they have four different words that mean love. But in English, we just have one. I love football. I love trucks. I love sports. I love working out. I love pizza. I love steak. I love my wife. Those are all the word love that we use. But the Greeks had four different ways of expressing love. So what I'm saying is there's, there's different levels of expression. The English language is very boring from, from what some other people who speak other languages tell me. It, it, it's not a, as expressive as other language. So, it is the plural form of El, Elohim. Number three, this name draws attention to God's power, strength, majesty and authority Deuteronomy 10 17 says the Lord your God Elohim is God of gods and Lord of Lords the great God mighty and awesome it demonstrates his power his strength his majesty and his authority now let's look at letter C combinations of his name the first one is El Elyon. We see that in Genesis, Numbers, Psalms, and Isaiah. It means the Most High God or the Exalted One. So anytime you see in Scripture, if you're reading an English transition, translation of the Bible, anytime you see the Most High God, it's a translation of El Elyon, the God who is the object of reverence, the God who is the object of worship, the Most High, the Exalted One. We sang that song on, on Sunday morning, I exalt you, I exalt you. That's El, El Elyon. Number two, El Shaddai. El Shaddai. I think it was Sandy Patty that came out with a song probably 20 years ago. El Shaddai. Maybe longer than that. El Shaddai. El Shaddai. It means the Almighty God. Literally, the God who is more than enough. The God that is more than enough. Although it refers to God's exalted nature, it carries the idea of God who condescends to enter into relationship, uh, into relations of friendship and blessing with his people. Let me say that again. Although it also refers to God's exalted nature, it carries the idea of God who condescends to enter into relations of friendship and blessing with his people. Letter C. The name stresses divine greatness, but primarily as a source of blessing and comfort for the people of God. Again, we're still talking about El Shaddai. Letter D. It indicates that God controls all the powers of nature and makes them serve his purposes. He is the almighty God. Remember we talked about the omnipotence of God, the all-powerfulness of God. It's this, the powers of nature makes, he controls them and makes them serve his purposes. Now, the literal meaning of El Shaddai actually means multi-breasted one. Now you say, what, what does that mean? And I want you to get, you, get this picture in your head. How many of you have had a dog or a cat give birth to a litter? So you have little puppies and little kittens, right? Come on, you can you work with me here. Raise, raise your hand if, you, if you've had a dog or cat give birth. Thank you. And you know that there's some in that litter that are a little bit stronger in a head than some of the other ones, right? There's usually a runt in the group that can't really get its way up to the breast of the mother in order to feed. Well, this picture of El Shaddai and, and the literal root meaning actually refers to 
a God who would take that, one, that weak one and help it up to the breast so that there is more than enough to feed on. So it doesn't matter where you're at in life or what cards you feel like you've been dealt. We serve a God that is more than enough to meet your needs and help you. God was saying, I have more than enough to bless the whole human race. I can bless you and nurture you. And that's the beautiful meaning of El Shaddai. God says, I am more than enough. Here's the thing about a God that's more than enough. God can bless Jeff. He can bless Josh. He can bless uh, Josephine, Josephine. He can bless every single one of us at the same time. His resources aren't limited. So I can pray for my brother to get blessed. Why? Because God can't, it is not a God who just blesses one person and then his blessings run out and he doesn't have enough for me. He's a God that's more than enough. As he's blessing one, he is fully capable of blessing another. I think somebody should have said amen there because if you're playing, praying for a blessing, you don't have to worry about the God you're praying to spending all of his blessings on the person that you're praying for. The Bible says it's impossible to water and refresh others without you yourself being watered and refreshed. A God that's more than enough. Roman numeral two, God's proper name. God's proper name. In the Old Testament, God's proper name is Yahweh. Yahweh. He gave us his name. He said, my name is Yahweh. We often say that in English as Jehovah. So when we transfer, uh, translate the Hebrew name Yahweh into English, it translates to Jehovah. Again, in the Hebrew language, there's no capitalization. There are no vowels in their alphabet either. So if you were writing Yahweh in English letters based strictly on the translation of Hebrews, it would look something like this. Yahweh. There's no capitalization and there's no um, vowels. Yahweh. In fact, some formal commentaries and their theo uh, and the theo the theologians, 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 on the Old Testament, you will see this phrase appear in their writings because they want you to know that they're talking about Yahweh, but they don't put the A or the E in there. It's just Y W H. What's that? Yes, lowercase. Now, God said, this is my proper name. When, they, when the Israelites asked, who do we say we serve? God said, Yahweh. It's his name. Number one, this is his covenant name to his people Israel. This is his covenant name to his people Israel. This is his sacred name which must not be taken in vain. The Bible says, do not take the name of the Lord in vain, right? To the Jew, it was, do not take the name of Yahweh in vain. It is said that the Jewish scribes, now remember, we're, we're going back thousands of years before we had the printing press and typewriters and all that sort of things that we can mass copy uh, the scriptures. So they had to physically write and, and copy letter for letter, word for word, the translations of the scribes. It, it is said that those people who did that, called scribes, had a separate pen that they would use just to write the name Yahweh. So they would be going along, copying, copying, copying. They got to the name Yahweh. They would put down that pen and pick up a special pen just to write the name Yahweh, put it back, and then go back to writing. That's how sacred the name of God was to the scribes. It also denotes that aspect of God's character that is personal rather than transcendent. It denotes the aspect of God's character that is personal rather than transcendent. 
that Yahweh has transcended to know us. Letter B. This name always occurs in contexts in which the covenantal and redemptive aspects of God predominate. Now, anytime God refers to covenant, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with David, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Adam, in fact, every time God speaks of covenant, he uses this name because he's, he, he wants to show that personal covenant with the people he is making it with. Number one, it reminds us that God is a God of grace. And by giving us his name, what is God saying? He's saying, I want you to know me. Number two, in giving this name, God made it clear that man could know him personally. God could have simply said, God, and said, I am Elohim, I am God. But God chose to give us his name. He said, I am Yahweh, Jehovah God. It means God wants us to know him. The name Jesus, as we'll see later, means Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah saves. This word Yahweh is an interesting word because, let us see, it's formed from the Hebrew verb, I am. When Moses asked, who should I say sent me? From the burning bush, God responded, I am. And it's from that verb that Yahweh is formed. Now that goes back to the whole idea of God's present tense. God is here with us. He's present. He's a God who is eternal, immutable, and self-existent. Number two, the name serves as a reassurance that God is unchangeable in his covenant relationship and mindful of his promises. The name serves as a reassurance that God is unchangeable in his covenant relationship and mindful of his promises. Now, I know I'm going through this a little bit quickly tonight. And, and like I said, it's because we have four lessons to get through in two and a half weeks. So hang in there with me and um, we'll, uh, we'll get through it together. Letter D, Adonai. The Hebrews held the name Yahweh in such reverence and awe that they feared even mispronouncing it. So they would substitute the word Adonai in his place, in its place. So instead of using the word uh, Yahweh, they would use the word Adonai and attempt to prevent from even mispronouncing it. Adonai refers to God as the mighty ruler to whom everything is subject. It is translated in the English as Lord. So when you look at your English Bible, and you're reading, you'll see sometimes LORD is in all caps, right? You've seen that before when you're reading it. When it's, when it's in all caps like this, this is Yahweh. This is what they're referring to as Yahweh. Now, you've also seen it like this, LORD. That is when they translate Adonai. Okay? Letter B. As Adonai, God has a right to the obedience and service of his people. As Adonai, God has a right to the obedience and service of his people. Now, let's look at the redemptive names of God. These are the names that God has enjoined the word Yahweh with, another word, to tell us something about himself. And I'm going to give these uh, to you sequentially as they are found in the Bible. Let's look at the very first one. Many of you have heard this one before, but it's found in Genesis 22. It's Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Now, this story comes from the story of Abraham. When God told Abraham to take your son, 
your only son, the son that I promised to you, that you waited 25 years for, that you had at a very old age, the child of the promise, take that son and offer him up as a sacrifice to me. As a side note, this is the very first time in the Bible where we see the word worship used. Abraham went to the base of the mountain. He looked around at his servants and he said, you guys stay here. The boy and I are going up to worship. Now, this house is a worshiping house. We know what it means to worship. If you were here Sunday, second service, you felt the power of worship. I mean, the presence of God was thick. The people were rejoicing and shouting. It was amazing. We know what it means to worship here. But worship is more than just singing. The very first time that worship is presented to us in the Bible, it is presented as sacrifice. It had to do with him offering his son. Now think about that. Right in the middle of this offering that Abraham was being asked, he said, my son and I are going to worship. And you know how the rest of the story goes, right? They go up to the mountain. He straps them all down. He gets ready. Can, can, can you imagine what's going on in, in his mind at that point? I mean, I don't have kids yet, but... I, I can't even imagine, you know, waiting for the, for the fulfillment of God's promise the way that Abraham did. And then God saying, okay, give it back to me. He said, okay, you know, and, and going back up. So all those emotions, all of those thoughts going on through his head. And we know what happens. God provides the ram in the thicket. And he names that place Jehovah Jireh the Lord will provide. Now, it's such a, such a powerful picture there. Jehovah Jireh, Jireh. What was God providing? God was providing a sacrifice. Now, think about this picture in your mind. And here it is like this. L l let me put it on the board for you. This is the mountain. And Abraham and his son are down here. They had servants. They had, they had donkeys. They had everything, right? They, they, it was, it was a, a you know, several days trip. They get to the bottom. And he says, all right, you guys stay here. We're going up the top of a mountain to worship. Going up. Going up. And, and, and it wasn't a short climb. It was an agonizing, long, brutal climb for them to get to the top. Well, pretend this is life. We're all going up the mountain of life, every single one of us. Sometimes we get hit and we go back, one step forward, two step back. Sometimes it's better than that. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. But that's still life. We're, we're all climbing life, right? To get to the top just like Abraham did on the other side of the mountain was the provision but as Abraham and Isaac went up the mountain they couldn't see what was on the other side of the mountain so they took a step up the ram takes a step up they take two steps up, he takes two steps up. Even when they get up here, they're, they're nearing the top of the mountain. They're, they're, they're almost at their breakthrough point. Now, now make this personal. Make this to where you are, you're at in your life. Make this into a situation that you're going through. And I want you to see how God works in this. That ram keeps going up, up, up. It's only when they reach the top that the ram reaches the top as well. And this is the place where Abraham said, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. He couldn't see it through the mountain. 
He had to keep walking in faith. And that's why we see later on in the scriptures that in, in the hall of fame of faith in Hebrews, it says Abraham by faith offered his son. He didn't know that God was going to do this. He was fully prepared to offer his son to sacrifice the promise that God had gave him. But he gets to the top and God says, all right, Abraham, now that I know, some of the most powerful words that I think that we could ever hear God say, now that I know. Now that I know what? Now that I know what's in your heart. Now that I know that I can trust you with whatever I give you. Now that I know you've been faithful to me, and even though you couldn't see what was ahead of you or coming up the other side of the mountain, you were still faithful and you were still obedient. Now that I know those things, I will not withhold anything from you. That's what the Bible says. Same thing happened with Jesus. Jesus was this lamb for us. We're going up the light. We're going up the mountain. We don't see. We don't see what we're doing sometimes. But all along, God was providing a sacrifice for us. John the Baptist looked at him and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That is Jehovah Jireh. Moving on, next we have Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Do you remember when they faced the bitter waters at Mar Marah and they were poisoned and God told Moses what to do with the rod and Moses touched the water with the rod and the waters that were poisoned became fresh and pure and the people were able to drink that water he said, I am the Lord Jehovah Rapha. He said, if you will obey me, I will put none of these diseases on you that I am put on the Egyptians, for I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. God wants us to know that it's his nature to heal. So he gives us his name, Jehovah Rapha. Let us see. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord who is my banner. The Lord who is my banner. Exodus 17 tells us the story of uh, Moses and the Amalekites where they were fighting. And, and God told Moses, as long as you will hold that rod over your head, your people will have the victory. And his arms began to fall down and the people started to lose. And then God brought Aaron and her up on either side just to keep the rod uh, up in the air so the people could win and God fulfilled his word and gave victory to the Israelites he is Jehovah Nisi the Lord is my banner it's about victory letter D Jehovah Makedesh the Lord who sanctifies and Leviticus and other places in the Bible we see the Lord who sanctifies you. I am the one who makes you holy. That word sanctify means to set apart. To set apart. To sanctify. Turn with me in your Bibles if you have it to Judges 6. I want you to see this. Letter E is Jehovah Shalom. The Lord who is peace. Judges 6, I want to read this. I love the story of Gideon. It says, verse 1, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. So get this picture. They disobeyed the Lord, so they're hiding out in, in caves and mountains. They can't live in the promised land like God had promised them because they disobeyed God and God allowed this foreign army to come in and, and just completely wipe them out. So they're hiding in the mountains. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. 
They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like a swarm of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. Camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So after they've been destroyed and just completely torn apart, they finally say, hmm, let me go ahead and call on the name of a God, you know, for help. Verse 7, when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. I think God was pretty mad with his people, right? He, he did all these things for him, and then he says, you know, just worship me. Don't worship the other people. Worship me. Can, can you make any um, connections with where we are today in our country? I don't want to get too political here because I'll get in trouble. But, you know, we were, we were a country founded on Christian and Judeo-Christian principles. There's no getting around that. The, uh, the book of Deuteronomy is quoted like 30% in the founding documents. So you can't tell me that it, it wasn't the inspiration for the people who founded this country to have it and found it on Judeo-Christian principles. Yet we have strayed. Then the angel of the Lord, verse 11, the angel of the Lord is a reference to a Christophany where Christ appeared in Old Testament times and sat down under the oak in Ophrah and, belo and belonged to Joash the Abyssalite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Get this picture. He had some wheat that finally made it to maturity that he was able to harvest, yet he had to... Th thresh it inside of a wine press to hide it from the Midianites because if they found it, they would come take it all away from him. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And check out Gideon's response here. I can just see him now looking around saying, pardon me, Lord? But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. He's doubting God here. He's saying, you, I remember the stories that our, our ancestors told us of what you did for us, how you brought us out of slavery, how you led us through the desert and you provided. I remember all those things, but you've abandoned us. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. He starts making an excuse. Here he's saying, God, uh, Jesus Christ, here, having a conversation with him, telling him that you are going to be the one to save Israel, and he starts making up excuses. How many of us do that sometimes? We start making excuses of why we can't do what God has called us to do. Verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if, I, if now I have found favor in your eyes... Give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Now he's like, Psh, I don't even know if it's really you talking to me, God. You got to give me a sign, you know, because I'm not a mighty man of valor. You know, I'm the weakest. He's, he's made all of his excuses, and he's finally saying, okay, well, if it's really you, and this is really going to happen, you got to give me a sign. Verse 18, 
please do, Gideon says, please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. This is another uh, example of why we believe this is a Christophany. Because you do not sacrifice offerings to angels. You sacrifice offerings to God. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread without yeast, putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot. He brought them out and offered them to him under the oak tree. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unlivid bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat with the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. That must have been a pretty cool uh, little scene right there with fire coming out of a rock. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he, you know, he finally realized after all this that it was the angel of the Lord. He said... Alas, sovereign God, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace, Jehovah Shalom. Many Israelis, when you go there and you greet them, they greet you, shalom, meaning peace. They greet you with peace. They're a very peaceful nation. No matter what the, the, the media and the TV tries to portray them as, they gave up land, they gave up oil for peace. They give up the entire uh, uh, little peninsula there with Egypt, with all the oil and everything that it has for peace. Now they have to import oil from oil and coal from Australia because none of their neighbors who are all rich with oil will sell it to them. And they gave up what they had for peace. Letter F. Jehovah Rohi. Jehovah Rohi. The Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23. We all know that one, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Letter G, Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord is our righteousness. He's predicting the coming of the righteous Messiah, and the Lord said, I am your righteous Messiah. And finally, the last name in the Old, in the Old Testament is Jehovah Shema, the Lord who is present. It's the very last verse in the book of Ezekiel. He said, I am the Lord Jehovah Shema, the Lord who is present. He's referring to the coming of the new Jerusalem where God will be present with us. But he wants us to know that he is not a God who's far away. He is a God who is present. Now, those names of God tell us something about how beautiful the redemptive work of God is in our life. Many people talk about the names of God. They spend most of their time in the Old Testament names. We even have a song that we sing that, that goes through a lot of those different names. But now let's look at the New Testament and what the New Testament has to say about the names of God. Remember, the New Testament was written in Greek. Letter A, the Old Testament names of God not only reveal to us the different dimensions of His character... They also point to the fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. They point to the fulfillment and in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at names of God used in the New Testament. Number one, Theos. T-H-E-O-S. Theos. This is God, the equivalent, the Greek equivalent of Elohim. In Titus, it is used of Jesus, Theos. Number two, Kyrios, which means Lord. And it's the Greek equivalent of Adonai and somewhat of Yahweh. It is used of Jesus in Revelation 22. 
He is called the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the word Lord is not his name, it's a title. Number three, pater, P-A-T-E-R. This is the Greek word father. Rarely used in the Old Testament in reference to God. In the New Testament, it refers to God as creator, as the first person of the Trinity, who stands in special relationship to the Son, and as the father of spiritual children who have believed on Christ. Jesus called the Father Abba, and has given believers the right to call God by his name. When you look at the life of Jesus, you see some very interesting things. You see that he had... Uh, somewhat of a childlike faith, a childlike relationship with his father. But he was also very confident with who he was. And that word um, pater, we also have the word Abba. I'm sure you've heard Abba, Father. Jesus actually spoke Aramaic. So the, when, he, when he was on the cross and he said Abba, it was the word daddy. It was the word papa. It was an affectionate, loving term for God. Now when we pray, I, sometimes we say Heavenly Father. Sometimes we say Father God, dear God. Sometimes I just say my father. I say daddy. I say papa. You know, that loving relationship that we, are, that we have with the Father. Letter C, names and titles of Jesus. Number one, Jesus, Jehovah is salvation. It's the same as the Hebrew word for Joshua. Jesus is Greek, Joshua or Yeshua is Hebrew, but they mean the same thing. Something that's interesting is that any time you find someone's name in the Old Testament that ends with the U-A sound, Joshua, Jeremiah, Isaiah, it always means that their name is a derivative of Yahweh. It ends in L. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it means that their name is a derivative of Yahweh. If it ends in El, like Daniel, Ezekiel, it's a derivative of Elohim, Elohim, okay? So if it ends with a UA, Joshua, Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah, it's a derivative of Yahweh. And if it ends in El, Ezekiel, Daniel, it's a derivative of Elohim. Number two, Christ. Christ means the anointed one. This is his title. It's not his name. It is the same as the Hebrew word for Messiah. So when in Israel, when speaking with Hebrew, if you would say Jesus Christ, it really means Jesus, Yeshua, Messiah. Now they don't recognize Yeshua as Messiah yet. But I believe the day is coming that they will. Roman, there, there, there's verses in Romans that say that there's a plan for the, the Jewish people. I don't know the plans of God. He knows them. But, but it's the same word, Hebrew word for Messiah, Christ. Number three, Emmanuel means God with us. It's the Greek translation of Emmanuel found in Isaiah 714. Number four, Savior. One who saves and delivers. It is a title, again, not a name, and refers to the soteriological work of Jesus. The saving work of Jesus. The, the salvation aspect of Jesus. Now, there are two others that we're going to look at. And the first one is number five, Son of God. A title of Christ which points to his deity. Son of God is used 46 times in the New Testament. 28 of those times are found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we call the Gospels. However, as I shared with you in the last session, Jesus never once referred to himself as Son of God. He always referred to himself, number six, Son of Man. A title of Christ which refers to 
his humanity. Eighty-four times the Son of Man is referred to Jesus in the New Testament. And Jesus almost always used this phrase to refer to himself, even though nobody else did. Not one other person in the New Testament called Jesus the Son of Man. I find that pretty interesting. Now, while it's a reference to his humanity, he is God in the flesh, it is really more of a reference to his Messiahship. I want you to write down these verses. Daniel 7, 13, and 14. It's the prophecy concerning the Messiah. And here's what Daniel wrote. He said, I saw one like the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days who was given dominion, glory, and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall never be taken away. That's Daniel 7, 13 through 14, Old Testament. Now Daniel said, I saw one coming like the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is obviously a reference to God himself. And he said, to this one was like the Son of Man. There was given dominion, glory, and kingdom, and people and power that will never pass away. Now, Jesus referenced this verse in Matthew 26. He said this to the people around him. He said, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds. Now he was saying to this, this Sanhedrin council, he was saying, I am the Son of Man that the prophet Daniel talked about. The, the Sanhedrin Council knew the Old Testament. That was their Bible. They were, they were religious scholars of the time, so when he referenced himself as Son of Man, they knew exactly what he was referring to. And that is why they picked up stones. And that is why they attempted to crucify him and eventually did. It was blasphemy for him to call himself the Son of Man. That's like saying... I am God. Now, as we close with this session, I want you to think about when you're praying in your quiet time, these names of God. And you may need healing for yourself, for a loved one. Call on the name of Jehovah Rapha. If you need provision, you call on the name Jehovah Jireh. If you need peace, you call on Jehovah Shalom. If you need victory over something in your life, you call on Jehovah Nisi. Whatever it is you need in your life, you call on the God of that need. And I promise you, He will answer. The psalmist said, Tr Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. When we realize all that his name contains, we too will put our trust in the name of the Lord.